Together, we can make your blonde blonde. Sheer Blonde Go Blonder Collection by John Frieda lightens and brightens hair two full shades to give you your best blonde every day. Hair Talks. Make your statement with Sheer Blonde Go Blonder Collection only from John Frieda. Blog Talk Radio. Once in a lifetime, does a great author set the stage for a wonderful trip into the minds and lives of their characters. Yvonne Mason doesn't just write books, she crafts experiences. Best-selling true crime fiction author Yvonne Mason will leave you on the edge of your seat and checking behind every corner for the weirdos that only real life can breed. Find her books on Amazon.com. Make sure you check out such titles like Dreamcatcher, Failure Was Never an Option, The Pink Canary, and Silent Scream Today. Well, it is Wednesday night, ladies and gentlemen. And if it's Wednesday night, it's off the chain. I am your host, Yvonne Mason. That was my friend Victor Aurelius doing some shameless promotion for me. And I do appreciate him. He and Chris Dunham do a lot of my ad work. And if you need some voiceovers, you need some ad work done, contact both of them. They are both on my Facebook page. Hook up with them because I'm going to tell you what, if you think that that ads and voiceovers don't work, mm, well, just another tool, ladies and gentlemen, for whether it's your book, your music, your artwork, your business, your platform. These guys are magnificent. And just to prove my point, tonight is our 109th show. We have been doing this show since July the 27th. We're not even a year old yet. And I had made a promise to myself and to my guests that by the end of this year we would be at 15,000 listeners overall. Because not only is this show up here on Blog Talk Radio, but I put it up on five podcasts. It is also on iTunes and YouTube, FN.com, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, Podcast.com, Podomatic, Podcast Garden, MixCloud, SoundCloud, and Spreaker. And because of that, ladies and gentlemen, we are up to 12,300 and two listeners overall. Just on Blog Talk Radio, we are already up to 4,802 listeners. I am so proud of this show because not only are we up to 12,302 listeners, but we are an international radio show. We have 45 countries that listen to us. And I know y'all get tired of my reading the countries, but I am so proud of this that I will continue to read the countries. We are listened to in Canada, in Germany, Korea, Egypt, Ecuador, the U.K., the Russian Federation, Indonesia, Singapore, Australia, who are, they are our biggest supporters. Seventy-two percent of our listeners on Blog Talk Radio are out of Australia. Thank you guys so much. Ireland, Croatia. Tunisia, New Zealand, Taiwan, Brazil, Pakistan, India, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, Portugal, Hungary, Bulgaria, Norway, the Ukraine, Vietnam, Finland, Sweden, Peru, France, the Philippines, Argentina, Mexico, Croatia, Venezuela, the Dominican Republic, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the Netherlands, Azerbaijan, and I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Spain, Malaysia, Lebanon, Kenya, and St. Lucia. We are growing as a show by leaps and bounds. When I started this show, I had no idea that it would take on its own life form, and I have my guests to thank for that. And because I do shameless promotion for myself since I can't get out and do events anymore, a golden opportunity dropped in my lap and I could not pass it up. I mean, when opportunity knocks, you have to answer the door because it may not knock again. I was approached by a company called VIDA, V-I-D-A, all capital letters. They are a 
design house. They have their own product, and they ask artists to put their designs on these products. I have a photo site out there at viewbug.com under Yvonne Mason, and apparently they saw my photos and asked if I would put my photos on their product. I looked into it. I did. And it's not a stencil design, nor is it an iron-on design. The designs are literally woven into the fabric before it becomes a sheet of material. My mother was the first recipient of one of my designs, and she called me up and she couldn't say enough. She said, Yvonne, I didn't understand what you were saying when you said that they were putting your photos on your on their product. She said, I cannot believe the colors and the way that they have blended the seams perfectly on both sides of my bag to fit. She says, it is a beautiful, beautiful tote bag. Now, I personally haven't seen any of my uh, work because I've got some on order, and I had sent her two pieces, and one the one piece she she's already gotten, and she called me up just raving. Now, my mother is a very particular woman. Her mother was a seamstress, and she, my mother is very... She's very particular about things, and she said the material that they use is absolutely amazing. This tote is lined, ladies and gentlemen. Where do you find totes that are lined? And it's lined in a silk-like material. So go to Vita.com and look up under my married name, Yvonne Sewell, and check out my collection. You won't be disappointed. And, again, go to Viewbug.com under Yvonne Mason and check out my photos. You can also purchase them. And hang them up on your wall if you're so inclined. Wouldn't it be neat to have a pillow with one of my designs on it and then have a piece of artwork on your wall to match it? I mean, there's so many possibilities. Now, that being said, and all the shameless promotion aside, tonight I have a return guest who I absolutely adore. I adore his work. I adore him. He thinks like I do. His name is Paul Herb, but he writes as Thomas S. Mulvey. And his his uh, pen name is an interesting collection of names. And he spent most of his childhood growing up on a dairy farm just a few miles north of Cassville, Missouri. When the chores were done and playtime came, and because his siblings were so much older than himself, Paul found that his imagination was his greatest ally, which allowed him to create cities and characters in his mind. The first story he wrote was about one of the cats on the farm, making the cat into a human being. And then when he got a typewriter for Christmas, it was like manna from heaven. He just couldn't stop writing. And that was his beginning as a lifelong career as a writer. Paul went to Cassville for a high school, and then he attended Crowder College, where he majored in business and automotive technology. After leaving college, Paul went back to his first love of writing, and he started with several articles in various automotive magazines. This led to Paul's first book, Chevelle SS Restoration Guide, which was published by Motor Books International. Nine other titles would follow with this publisher before he would venture into the publishing field himself and started his own company, PAH Publishing. With his own company, he would author under many different pen names, more than 20 other titles. In 2015, that call came back to creating stories that would call him back, and under the pen name Thomas S. Mulvey, he would author and publish his first novel, Blood Necklace, a murder mystery set in his hometown of Cassville, Missouri. The centers on former Kansas City homicide Detective Rick Ryder, whose high school sweetheart is murdered at Roaring State at Roaring River State Park, and he returns to Castle to saw, but what he finds is a twisting tale of lies that forever changes his life. Now I have read Blood Necklace, ladies and gentlemen, and to this day I'm still mad at Paul because he kept me up all night. This book is absolutely one of the most fascinating books I have ever read. I would turn the page and say, I'm just going to read one more page, and then before I knew it, it was 4 o'clock in the morning. And I don't sleep much as it is, so at 4 o'clock in the morning, I'm going, now what? And it takes a lot to keep me 
engaged in books anymore because, I don't know, maybe it's because I write, maybe it's because I'm too critical, uh, maybe it's because I can figure out the, the plot line before I get to the end of the book and maybe I'm just too analytical, I don't know. But, but Paul's book kept me guessing to the bitter end. And the title Blood Necklace will deceive you because it's not what you think it is. So without further ado, welcome, my friend. How are you? Thank you for joining me tonight and spending an hour with me. I so appreciate you. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. I I tell you what, Mr. Ryder, he needs to um, solve his his mysteries because now you've got – well, before we get into, into Rick Ryder, I know you've been on the show before and told a little bit of your history, but just for the folks that this is their first time, give them a short history of Paul because you you fell into writing in an interesting way because you had to look after your mother for many years. Am I correct? Yes. Uh, when I got out of college, uh, she developed a severe rheumatoid arthritis and it was either we put her in a nursing home or I would take care of her and kind of forgo my life, really. And uh, I chose to do stuff and I, to do that. And I needed something to do to occupy my time because you just wasn't just just taking care of her was just, uh, you know, the taking care of her to, like, fix her meals and get her out of bed and stuff like that. There's a lot of times that I'm just sitting around watching TV so I chose to, I got the old typewriter out and decided I'll do some writing. And I basically typed out an article, and there's a few that was that was rejected, but I typed about what I know about, and that was cars. And I typed out a article to, it was how to spot a genuine 69Z28. Sent it in and didn't hear anything. I got the, I got a magazine in, in the mail. And I started flipping through it, and sure enough, I saw this article that was just like mine, and thought, "What the heck is going on?" And then I saw my byline, and that's what did it. And I just decided I wasn't going to stop then. So, so you had no idea that they had accepted the article. They just published it and said, "Sent you a magazine with no cover letter, no nothing." Yeah, they never sent a cover letter, no no check or anything till I contacted them back and they said, "Oh, it was a mistake, uh, you know." And it was like $25, but that was the biggest thing to me was that byline because uh, I was telling everybody I knew and I think everybody in my family con- hunted for that one magazine. Uh, just for that that article to say, "Hey, that's my little brother or whatever." So and the thing is, there's nothing like the thrill and the feeling of satisfaction when a writer sees their their hard work in print. That That is, I don't know about you, but to me, every time I hold in one of my new books in my hand or see something that I've written come to life in print, it, it sends a glow through my whole body. Oh yes, that that's what it did me. I was just calling everybody I know uh, that it was there that said, "Hey, you got to get up this magazine. I'm I'm in it." And they they couldn't figure out for a while that, oh, "What do you mean you're in it? You got a your car? My car was in it or something?" I said, no, I wrote an article in this and it was published. And I think that they couldn't find the article. They couldn't find the magazine at all in Cassville. I mean, everybody cleaned them out. So. Wow. Yeah. So, so they had to go someplace else, or they had to call a company and get one. Yeah, they had to. They had to get more. They had to ask the guy that delivers the magazines, you know, to the grocery stores and stuff where we'd buy a magazine to get more of this certain magazine because they didn't have any, and they had people requesting it. So. And and that. That within itself, Paul, I believe, made you successful. 
and and when I say that, people look at me like, well, he didn't make a whole lot of money, and but it didn't matter. What mattered was you were in print, and people wanted it. That is success yeah. because you did something. You didn't say, well, I should, I would, I coulda. You did it. Yeah, that's that's what the whole thing is. That's what I tell other writers. Uh, they over, are always coming up to me. How do you do this? What do you do? I said, well, you've got to try, and if you get rejected, it's just part of the thing, but you've got to try, and if you, when you do get it, it's beyond something you can even put words into. I mean, for a writer that can't put words, but you, it's, it's hard to actually even explain what it is, really, that feeling. It really is because it's it's not something, and we're we are wordsmiths. Words are 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 trade, but it is not something that we know how to articulate because it is such a a special deep sense of accomplishment to be able to say this is what I did. I put the, I wrote this. This is. This has been published. It's in print. It's for the whole world to see if they so choose. Yeah, that was about it. Uh, matter of fact, I had all my brothers and sisters and everything were just, you know, they were just so shocked and wondering how this was. And I happened to call up a cousin of mine that was about like a second mother to me. And I told her what I had done. And she says, well, that's no shock to her, she says. It's. I knew that was going to happen anyway because your imagination is there all along. So <laughs> she wasn't shocked at it. So. Well, any anyone that makes the story up of a cat and turns a cat into a human being as a child, it, I don't blame her. I probably wouldn't have been shocked either because it was just a matter of you finding your level and running with it and taking care of your mother was part of the journey because do you think that if you hadn't gone and, and taken on that responsibility of love that you would have started writing when you did? I don't think so. I always tell them that I didn't choose writing. Writing chose me because uh, I never set out saying, okay, I'm going to be a writer. Even though I'd love to do it, I just never thought about doing it for a career. It was just I had an idea that I wanted to be a car salesman, and I had like one, two or three days of actually having that job and quickly got rid of it because it just wasn't me. So <laughs> It's funny how the dreams change, and it doesn't mean that it was a bad dream. It was a beautiful dream, It was, but it was not the right dream. No, because it's just, I mean... Where other guys be worrying, think about the next sale or whatever, I'm my brain starts going on a tail of okay, what if a terrorist comes into the the uh, dealership and then this goes down and and it it's always there's always been a story somehow going through there. I just I don't realize that other people don't see that. I guess so. Well, it takes a certain kind of person to to understand where your head is because, like you, I see a story in everything and in every place I go. There's a story. When my husband and I used to take cruises, I saw stories in every port we landed, even on the ship. My mind was the the people in my head were dancing around, going, "Let me out, let me out." You see, I'm behind that door. You see, I'm going to do this, and I'm going. Would you shut up? I'm supposed to be on vacation. And no, <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. No, that don't work that way. No, and, it does not. And that's and, what and I told. Just... I told my wife. I thought I want to know what she thought. And I said, when you hear music, do you see a movie playing out in your head? And she said, no, she didn't see that. And I thought, I thought everybody saw that. I mean, that's just what I, I, I think is I hear a you know a song. It's that way, and I hear it as not as so much the song but a backdrop of a movie that's playing in my head so i do too especially the the songs that have a that have an absolute theme to them as you were talking and of course we've been talking cars i'm thinking of little deuce coop and i'm yeah. seeing this little deuce coop and it's 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 the triggers that we have as as writers that sets 
movies off in our head and send the voices shouting to high heaven, and if we don't shut them up, I think they would drive us insane. I imagine so, because I've had to tell my preacher at church that don't think anything about it if I'm uh, on my my cell phone typing anything. I'm not texting anyone. It's just that you probably something you've said has tr- triggered a an image in my mind and an idea for the story, and I'm just getting it down. So. And we have to. If we, There's been days, Paul, that I could not write fast enough. I couldn't put notes down. I have a storyboard in my office that when the voices start on the current books I'm working on, they start jumping up and down and wanting out. I have to put them on that storyboard. Now, I have no idea where they're going to go in the story, but they're determined to be in the story, and I know eventually they'll be there. Oh yeah, I've done that. I mean, I, last this story I'm working on now, uh, I had three ideas in one night, and I was had to, okay, got to get up and get this idea down. Just started to get to sleep. Oh, got another idea, and it just kept didn't get much sleep that night, but got a lot of ideas though. So <laughs> I understand that. Now let me ask you something. Sometimes when you lay down and close your eyes, do you literally see characters? Behind oh, yeah. your eyes, are they yes, real? Definitely I mean, so. you, you see them moving around and doing their thing, and you want to reach out and touch them. You almost can. Yes, I think so. Yeah, uh, I did that with Rick Ryder. I just happened to it just laying, and and I could see this guy and what he looked like, and I had to get up again and jot him down and this this, this description because. I'm, I'm sure he's never what the reader sees. Um, Carla's read it, and and she sees him as someone else. And I said, well, that's not who I see him as, and it's just that kind of thing. So, and and again, we're we're talking about interpretation. We as writers write the way we see it in our head, but a reader might, as Carla does, and sees her, the character a different way. And there's that. That's the beauty of a book. Yes. Is a person I mean, can use their own imagination to make that book come alive, and it doesn't make it right or wrong. It makes it unique. And that's what I, that's what I like about you know stories better than a a movie because a movie is is how it the uh, writer there is their vision kind of overcomes and it there's no imagination left. But in a book, it's whoever so. Well, for instance, my husband reads a lot of the Jack Reacher series, and Jack Reacher is six foot two, strong as an ox, dark headed, rough looking. Well, then Hollywood bought a couple of the books, and guess who played the main character? Yeah, Tom Cruise, and that just—I yeah. just can't get still get over that one. It and it's totally opposite of the character in the book. And what I told, um, we were talking about it, I said, well, what they did is they took the essence of Reacher and gave it to Tom Cruise, the actor. So Tom Cruise is supposed to appear bigger than life, but he's, what, 5'5", 5'6", 5'10", something Something like that, yeah. Yeah, and he's he's small built. And you, you have to sort of get past your imagination of who Reacher's supposed to look like <laughs> and just pick up the essence of who Reacher is in order to make the movie enjoyable. <laughs> I know, and that's that's what it'd be like your husband who's read the book maybe before the movie, you're not as bad off as being spoiled because you've still got that character in your mind. But mm-hmm. if you watch the movie and then go to read the the book you've got tom cruise as this character and you're thinking okay wait a minute this guy's <laughs> supposed to be doing this and exactly mm. and you're going what is going on here so yeah. with that with that being said let's talk about your character rick Ryder. he is one of my favorite characters because he's flawed and that's what I love about your work. 
you don't make him the perfect cop. He is yeah. so flawed that he is lovable. You just want to say, please don't open that door. Please don't pick that up. Please don't do that. And knowing he's going to do it because hes that's who he is. What brought Rick Ryder to you? Oh, wow. That's a, that kind of a tough question. I, I won't, I've seen so many... You know the TV shows and read books and stuff to where the 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 tough guy is always this big tough. He's has no emotions and and just has no feelings really. You just can't get to him and and I'm thinking well, that isn't what real people are like. Uh, I've known quite a few cops in my life and they're not that way. So I wanted to create him to where. He was, yes, he's big, he's tough, he's the good-looking guy, but he's also got this past with his dad and his the family and how he grew up that they're, that still affects him because that, that kind of stuff affects us, you know. And I didn't want to make him, like you said, perfect or that standoffish or whatever. I wanted him to have feelings that he could he could cry, he could care, and everything like that, so... Well, and, and in real life, our our past with our family, even though we don't want it to, always affects our present and our future because our family is probably the closest people in our lives. And it's it's a unit that we are involved with every day of our lives, good times, bad times, and different times. All the warts, all the bad personalities, all the fights, all the all the happy times, everything that goes on in a family unit, we bring with us, and we can't help but bring, because it's part of who we are. And yeah, it either will make it. us or break us. <laughs> that, that was kind of the thing I wanted, is I wanted him to be, you know, this tough cop that could take on in a gun battle, but at the same time, a memory of his father and how he treated him uh, would change him to a, basically a, like a little child sometimes. So, it and it that. made him vulnerable. It it made yeah. him able to sometimes see things in a different light than if he were this non-emotional super cop. Yeah. And uh, the readers who have contacted me back, you know, that have, that have went to the trouble to actually hunt me down and, and contact me have said that that's what they love about him. Uh, I had a guy that was recently finished it, and he said, you'll find yourself rooting for him because he is that way real. And then I've got women that want to, they want to marry him if they could. So. <laughs> okay. I mean, I actually had one. She called up. She went. She contacted me through Facebook on the personal message thing, and she uh, contacted me that way. And she said she wanted to know who I based him on because she wanted to know who he was because she'd love to marry him. And I had to explain to her that, sorry, sweetie, but he he doesn't exist. He comes right out of my head. And if you think I'm like him, uh, I can have you, Carla, tell you I'm not. So. <laughs> That now see, Paul, that is that is the epitome of an excellent author when women contact you and want to meet the person that you based your character off of because he 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 becomes real. That's why I couldn't put the book down. I'm thinking I'm I'm just gonna read one more page. <laughs> just just one more page and before like I said, before I knew it it was four o'clock in the morning, I'm thinking I got to get up in three hours and and work and take care of my day. And here I am reading this. When I see Paul, I'm gonna beat him. It's <laughs> all <laughs> <By> your fault. <laughs> I've been I've but, had that a couple times for people. So, but it was it was that good of a book. It, it what you did in Blood Necklace is, ladies and gentlemen, Paul set the stage for this story. 
and he literally, literally drags the reader into that story as if they're on the outside looking in, and you can't stop. It's like watching a train wreck. You can't stop watching it even though you know it's going to happen. You you can't turn away any more than you can put that book down because you you catch yourself going back to it saying, well, I just got to see what's going to happen. I'll just read one more page. Well, three hours later, you're still in the book. Uh, that's I never thought of that when it was you know I was going to be doing that. I just thought, okay, this is the story I have, and I thought, okay, well, we'll see what well, it does. Well, now, now you've gone and compounded my problem, and I mean that in a good way, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not putting Paul down because he's an excellent writer. Paul has just finished the second in the series because at the end of Blood Necklace, you're sort of left wondering he leaves it open-ended so he's just finished the second in the series called blood curse now this picks up with detective writer who's now a pi and tell some of the tell the, the listening audience he he's a unique private investigator tell them why he's unique uh well he's had a career of careers really uh he started out he was a sports star in uh, high school and then to college he was drafted by the Kansas City Chiefs as a starting quarterback and uh on Monday night football he is sidelined and takes his knee out from under him to where it ends his his uh football career and he then goes to join the Kansas City uh, Police Department, and he becomes a detective there and goes on to uh, be in the Homicide Division. And uh, he ends up tracing down a serial killer called the Kansas City Butcher who just kills 13 people in the Kansas City. And the last one is um, a little girl that is murdered and this bugs him so bad he quits the force and with his last dollar he buys a powerball ticket and he hits all the numbers and becomes the biggest powerball winner of all time which is one billion dollars in cash and he uh, uses this money now to help people that need to a detective but can't afford one because he charges a dollar a day and he pays the expenses. And and ladies and gentlemen, anyone that has ever looked up a private investigator, they're not cheap. Trust me. They are they used to be two hundred dollars a day plus expenses. Now I'm sure it's a thousand dollars a day plus expenses. They are not cheap. So this character decides to do good with his windfall that he's gotten. And in the first book, his high school sweetheart's murdered. So now he's got to go figure out why. And and I got the feeling, Paul, during the book, that he still had some lingering feelings for this young girl. And that, yes. that's part of what drove him to solve her murder. Yeah, that was it, yeah. Now, and, you know, what happens in Blood Curse? Where do you pick up the story, and what is he doing in Blood Curse? Blood Curse, he has his first, basically the first case of a guy that is, he is, um, his first uh, client is uh, accused of murdering his wife in Eureka Springs. And Arkansas, and he has hired him of this, and he starts digging into this murder that is there, and he finds out that it's it's awful a lot like the same killer, this Kansas City butcher that he supposedly he and his FBI agent friend put away in prison, but the 
ideas and things that they're they are doing are happening again. Uh, for example, he gets a rose, just like before. The killer, the the Kansas City butcher, would send him a rose and a note to tell him before the next the murder was going to happen. And now these these same roses and these same notes, which the handwriting matches, is suddenly occurring again, and there are murders occurring in in Eureka Springs. So has has his client been arrested for the murder of his wife? Yes, and the the book starts out with that he's about to be arrested, I should say. He is held up in a trailer, and he is trying to, and Ryder's trying to get him out, and it ends up, it blows up and takes the guy out, but Ryder still wants to prove that he didn't do it, and that's where it starts. Now, you've just released this one. Gonna keep me up all night again. And you're working <laughs> you're working on the third one called Blood Stains, am I correct? Yes. Yeah. Now this one this... uh this one takes more place in Kansas City back again, so and it's still Ryder doing his thing. Yes, it's Ryder doing his thing, and this time it's another character that, a uh, pair of characters that were from the first book are now back in the second book. Uh, it's uh, the it's the, bar- the uh, barbecue guy that was a former NFL player, and his nickname's Mother because of curse words that would be said when he would break through a defense line and run for a touchdown. They'd call him that, so... <laughs> And it's and it happens to be his wife that is murdered in the first of this book, and and the odd thing is is that the, the how this idea got started was Carla. She happened to be coming back home from shopping, and she come in. She goes, "I know who you can kill the next book," and <laughs> and that's what did it. So, <laughs> gotta love Carla. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> She's gonna keep you. And the writer series from now, you're going to be another Lee Charles and Jack Reacher's. With this is to me, this is where it's going because you write in that kind of vein, where Lee Charles always leaves the reader going, "What's Jack Reacher going to get into next?" Yeah. And and he is a troubled soul. He's he's like writer. He's a troubled soul. He's um, more or less a loner. Writer's more or less a loner, and he's he doesn't have to go looking for trouble. For some reason, like Writer, it drops in his lap on a daily basis. Yeah, that's kind of the out there. Uh, writer's always case is always it's going to be because it's even in this one. It looks like a simple murder case, but it always turns into something much much worse. So. Well, again, you're going to keep me up all night. Again, because I won't be able to put Ryder down. No, ladies, I, he's he's not a real person. But you've got to read the books. Even if you read, even if you ladies read um, romance, trust me, you will love these books simply because of the way that Paul writes. He brings these characters to life so much that that you. You want to reach out and touch him, and you want to help him solve the case because you know he's doing inner demon battles along with trying to solve cases, and then he has these triggers. Then he has to take two steps back. And you just shake your head going, are you ever going to get on the right path? Yeah. Well, that's, I don't know where he's going. That's just the, he's kind of like real for me too sometimes. I mean, that's... Uh, I've had people ask me, said, do you, you, you know, you talk to him like him, like he's a real person. And I said, well, these people are kind of are real to me. I mean, it's, you create they them. Are. And, they are and, indeed real to us because we live with them. We sleep with them. We eat with them. We, they won't shut up. 
in our heads. We dream with them. We they're there all the time. Now, ladies and gentlemen, he does not write under Paul Hurd. He writes under Thomas S. Mulvey, M U L. V-A-U-G-H, and there's an interesting story behind your pen name. And I know we talked about it the last show, but I want people to hear it again so that this name will stick with them. Uh, well, the, the reason I had to do this is I talked to an editor, and they said, well, your name is so associated with automotive car stuff that if anybody picks this up, they're going to think, okay, this is about a cars and stuff like that. So you said you're going to have to change your name, and I picked this name because it is my great-grandpa's name, Thomas Mulvey. Uh, he was a full-blooded Irishman that came here eh, in the 1800s, I think during the Great Potato Famine, as I think it was. And and the thing is that about the S is it is my uh, wife's, Carla, it's her great grandma uh, grandfather's name is Samuel, and that kind of does that. And Carla kind of helps me with this sometimes in in the fashion and interior descriptions and stuff. So it's kind of we all write this together. So. And and that is is a beautiful thing. I have a lot of support from my husband, and I absolutely adore him for it because a lot of writers don't. And the fact that she comes in from grocery shop and telling you who you can kill off next and <laughs> and reads and supports you and helps you do the interior descriptions and that sort of thing, you can't buy that kind of of um, partnership. Oh, no, no. It, it's different if, if you have a third party come in and do that. But with, with Carla... She's right there with you every day. She knows how your mind works. She knows your psychic. She knows, she knows writer. Oh yes, yeah. And she it knows makes, that. Mm. And it makes and it a beautiful the, thing. And the lead character in Kara. So exactly. Now you own your own publishing company. It's P A H Publishing. But right now you are the only author under that imprint, correct? Yes, so far, yeah. Somewhere down the road, are you considering bringing on authors? I probably wouldn't be opposed to that, you know, if I could find the right things. Um, I wouldn't want a, another mystery writer, I don't think, uh, that way, but I wouldn't be opposed to some other kind of maybe outlet of it. Because there's there's all kinds of new genres cropping up every single day. I didn't when when I first started, there were the the standard genres. Now we've got genres I've never even heard of. You've got oh, erotic yeah. romance. You got paranormal romance. You've got um, sci-fi romance, sci-fi paranormal. You've got fairies and fantasies and things I've. I'm going, okay, you're making my head spin. Yeah. It's just, it's amazing how it's been that way, because that's what it was when, I, you know, I started basically with the car books. It, it went different that way, so. Now, let me ask you this, and I think I know the answer, but our audience might not. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we are, we are considered in, indie authors. And there, there are more of us at this point in time than there are what we call traditional authors under the big six umbrella. And the reason there are more of us as indie authors is, number one, we walk our own path. Number two, we control our own destiny. And number three, we really don't like others telling us what, content, what book covers, and how to market. Would that be one of the reasons that instead of trying to break into the big six, which is like trying to break into Fort Knox, that you chose to go that route? I mean, I've still got friends that refuse to publish because they're not one of in, in with the big six, and they're hurting themselves. I'd rather get my work out there and be in control, but wait 
and maybe never get it out there. Would that be a fair statement for you? Oh, yes. I mean, I there was a comment one time on an article about that, that basically we were just, like you said, the indie authors and indie publishers, we were just basically dog slime or something to compare. To, they just wouldn't take us. They wouldn't care. And I agree that there's totally different ways of doing it now. You I mean, back in the years, in like 80s or something even, you couldn't have done this. But now, yeah, I, I want to do what I want to do. I don't want people telling me to, okay, have your character do this or maybe make him a little bit stronger. And I know, I know who he is. I want him the way he is. And I just, I'd rather do it my way. And besides, they're not going to do anything now. Most of the publishers, unless you are a name that is recognizable, they're not going to do any legwork for you or promotion. You're going to have to do it anyway, so you might as well do it on your own and and make well, the money and, and that I, they're doing. So, And, and the, the thing is, it cuts out the middleman for one thing. And for another thing, when an author sends a book into a one of the big six publishing houses, well, number one, they're under contract, and they have to turn out so many books in a year. Well, I like taking my time with my books, especially the books I'm working on now. I may crank out one book a year, two books a year if if I'm in the mood. But once they get that book, that book no longer belongs to that author. Sure, it's got their name on it, it's copyrighted by them, and they get paid royalties on it. But the content of that book, more times than not, is rewritten by their in-house editors and proofreaders to the point that it's not even the same story that they started out with. And for years, for years, the Big Six has told us what we can read and what we cannot read. When we as indie authors, I burst on the scene in 2007. That's how long I've been out there. And like you, I started in the 80s and the 90s and was rejected so many times I could paper my entire house. And we were looked down on. We were like the gum on the bottom of their shoe. But I found out something. Number one, we're we're very good at what we do. And people that choose not to read us, shame on them because they're missing a boatload of excellent books. And number two, we get to write what we want to. We get to place our characters the way we want to. We get to control the book cover because I've seen some horrible book covers from the big six. And oh, yeah. If we want to go do a book signing somewhere, we don't have to ask anybody's permission. Yeah. yeah I, I agree with that. I like the idea of, you know, my own book cover because I'm sure the big six would have probably would have ended up making mine look more like a romance cover than it would have been a, a the cover I wanted, so. Exactly. And the cover that you got is ominous. It is intriguing. It is dark. And it makes one want to pick up the book. If if I see a book and the book cover looks like something threw up on it, I won't even open the book up to see what it's about because if you don't have a popping book cover, you can forget somebody buying that book. Yeah. Oh, the that's the matter of fact the cover for Blood Curse is uh, kind of a uh well the whole book is basically kind of a thing from my church. Uh a lady that's in my Sunday school class uh helped me copy edit it. And and then and another one that's in my church, she um, is the model on the uh, front cover, so in the Thanks. cloak, so <laughs> And see, and this is the beauty of us as Andes. We can use friends and relatives and make them feel like they're part of our dream. They get to take the journey with us. Yeah. Well, the one lady that's on the cover, she, her husband was saying something. She said that she showed him the cover and says, "You better be careful." She says, "I'm a killer, you know, right now." So. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That is too funny. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's 
the people that we are that we can incorporate into our journey, they get to be part of that dream, which makes that dream so much more special. Yeah, yeah. And it, I think and it is. makes us feel good that we were able to give them a piece of that. And it, who knows? It might inspire her to live a dream she never knew she could live. Never know. I mean, that's just the thing. And there's others that coming up, like I said, that wanna they wanna try to be a writer, and that's one of the questions I get all the time if I'm out or anywhere. Basically, is they say, "Oh, you're that guy that writes the uh, murder mysteries. How do I start that? How do I do something like that?" So I usually try to help of, them. I mean, that was one of my questions. What advice do you give someone who who wants to write? And and Fortunately, you and I kind of had an idea of where we wanted to go and how we wanted to get there, but we had to make our own roadmap, and we've probably both taken a few detours in our life, but we had some idea. I've been marketing since I was five years old, so marketing was not new to me. But yeah. if if someone came up to you and said, Paul, I've got this 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 idea, and I want to put it on paper, but I'm at a loss. I don't know what to do next. What would you tell them? I said basically, you just got to try. I mean, that's there's everybody can everybody wants to be a writer, but only very few are writers. You have to sit down. You have to either do it longhand or in at the front of the computer or whatever you want to do, but you have to get that story down. It's just start it. That's basically the way it goes. I mean, just get an opening for it, and if you know how it ends, then you just connect the two end pieces together. So, Well, see, that's, that's part of my problem. I never know how my stories are going to end. I don't even I don't even know what the middle's going to be about until the voices tell me. Well, that's the thing. I just Well, it's a thing here, this third one. Uh, it, that's an idea of how the characters come alive, and they tell you things that you go, okay, I didn't know it was that. Mm-hmm. I was writing, and she's telling me, okay, that uh, it's Alex, it's the FBI agent from the first one, and she's a recurring character, and she's telling Ryder, you remember the thing we had done da, 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 in Blood Necklace? Well, that didn't happen, according to the United States government. That's been wiped away. So, okay. And this is part of this third one that's going to take them back, because some of the villains that were in the first are reoccurring in the third one. So, And and you have to wait for Alex to tell you that. You had no idea you were going to write that till she said, okay, this is what's going to happen. Yeah, I was just thinking, okay, I just had it something else. And she says, oh, by the way, this never happened to us. And, <laughs> okay. You know what? And of course it happened. It was in the first one. No, it never happened. Read, read my lips, Paul. It never happened. Put it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I did. I thought, okay, well, she seems to know better the story than I do, so. And if you I don't put it, it down. And do you do you find that if you don't put it down, she will not let you go any further until you do what she tells you to do? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely so. Yeah, yeah, because she was just determined. I mean, they're in the middle of a snowstorm, and he's she's telling him, okay, everything that happened in this, and the, you know that we done it happened. But yes, according to all the government computers, it didn't happen. It was just this and that, and and. You know, this, I thought, okay, we'll do it that way, so. Because if you didn't, I guarantee you, if you hadn't have done what she told you to do, you could not have gone any further in the story because she would have literally shut you down. Yeah, I've had that happen, and I've had to go, okay, okay, I'll go back and do it. and Whatever you and, want. You know the story better than me. I'm just the messenger. Would you believe? Is. Would you believe that our hour is almost up? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, It goes by so fast. Yes, it does. Tell the, <laughs> but you're coming back because you're going to be releasing the set, the third in the series. So as soon as you get it ready to launch, let me know, and I'll bring you back and we'll launch it on the show. Okay, that'd be good. 
Tell the folks where you can be found. I, I can be found on Facebook. Uh, I'm that either as uh, myself as Paul Hurd, or I can as Thomas Mulvey. Thomas S. Mulvey. I have a author page for him. I also have a. Uh, a uh, Facebook page for the book series, which is the Ozark Blood Mysteries. And uh, I also can be found at tsmulvey, that's M-U-L-V-A-U-G-H, dot com. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, as an avid reader, I mean a voracious reader, and I critique books all the time, even from the big six, I'll critique those books because, my mind won't let me do anything else. Go get his books. You will not be sorry. They are absolutely wonderful. Get Blood Necklace first, and then get Blood Curse second, and then beat him up until he releases Blood Stains. Because I've had a lot of people will. doing that. So <laughs> <laughs> You will not be sorry. This man is an absolute, if you like Lee Childs, you will love Thomas S. Mulvey. Trust me. And ladies, you you will love his series because they are absolutely out of this world. Better than any romance you've ever read. Now, as as we close the show, of course, Paul, you know I am so appreciative of you coming on the show, and and I just I am so honored that that you agree to come back and spend an hour of your time with me because time is precious. But it just it it makes me very humble that that you guys continue to come back and support the show because I couldn't do it without you. I'm telling you, we wouldn't be at twelve thousand plus listeners without all of y'all, and I appreciate you so so much. And but we appreciate you, wrote, you too, you know. So. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I say this at every show, and I believe it, I live it, I breathe it, I eat it, I sleep it. I waited a long, long time to be successful. I mean, a long time. Try my 50s. Because people said... You can't. So to all of those, all of my teachers, I had some good ones, but some of those teachers and back down in grammar school that told me no, and all of those adults that told me no, I just want to thank you because look at me now. I am a successful author. I've been on television three times, fixing to be on television a fourth time. I have written 18 successful books. I have a radio show. I have a photo site where photos are for sale. I have a design collection site on Vita.com under Yvonne Sewell. I am successful. I am empowered. And, yes, ladies and gentlemen, I am a woman. Paul is successful. Paul is very successful. And out of traversity and out of being a caregiver, he found success. It was a blessing that he had to go home and look after his mother. So when things happen in your life that you think, oh, God, I'll never do anything now because I've got to do this, you take that and you turn it around. I can't travel anymore because my husband is disabled. I started this radio show because my husband is disabled. Look where we are. Paul, would you agree that's a fair statement? I agree that's a real fair statement. You never know what you're, where you're, basically we're just like characters in a book. Exactly. Um, I think God's the one's writing it, and he knows, just like we do, he knows how the the story ends, and he's got to get you there, so. And and so when when you have something happen in your life, you can do one of two things with it. You can own it and make it work for you, or you can make it negative, make it drag you down. I cho- chose to own it. The radio, sta- the radio show was a five-year dream. In less than a year, we're almost to 15,000 listeners. The point is, never let anyone steal your dream without your permission. It is your dream. You own it. 
you make it yours, and you make it happen. Encourage your children, ladies and gentlemen. I don't care if they're unique or not. Encourage your children to live their dream. Would that be a fair statement, Paul? I'd say that would be a real fair statement because if it wasn't for people in my family, like my big sister, uh, who was the one that bought me the typewriter and always, always encouraging me, I probably wouldn't have exactly. done what I've done either. So. so with that, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to say tomorrow night, my friend Chris Dunham will be my guest at 8 o'clock. We are now off the air. So, I mean, that, that hour flew, flew by. Oh, it did. So what, I'm going to do like I always do. I'm going to wait for this thing to go up in archives, and I'm going to um, tag you in it when I put it up on the Facebook page. And tomorrow when I put all the podcast up, I'll put the links up and tag you in it. And please, 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 please use this to your advantage. Oh, I'm definitely going to. I'm going to put it on mine and Thomas Mulvey's and Ozark Blood and my website and have but other people everything. share it too. So, and if it if you find if someone comes to you and says, "How do I get on the show?" You know what to tell them because I have people contact me all the time to be on the yeah. show. We're, we're booked through. We're booked through the end of July. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's so good. We are, we are doing really, really well. So, my friend, I will let you go. Thank you again for spending an hour with me. It it well, was amazing, and it it just five minutes, and it was an hour gone. Oh, and I, I know. Can't wait. I enjoyed it very much. Well, I can't wait to have you back. So, let me know as soon as you get ready to launch Blood Stains. Okay. Send me the, the updated cover and all that, and I'll put it up on the. Um, Put it up on the show, and we'll set up another show for you. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you, sweetheart. You too. Talk to you later. Uh, uh, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Napa Know How. Napa Guy knows not to judge a man by his car's multicolored paint job or absence of modern gadgetry. Who cares if it's technically old enough to vote and the windows are powered by the strength of your left arm? Your monthly payment is zero, and it'll stay that way. Because with over 500,000 parts and a little Napa know-how, you can keep anything on the road. She may not be pretty, but she's all yours. That's Napa know-how. Napa know-how. Hi, this is Maury Moreland Morrison, here to tell you GEICO has more than just great savings. Much more. GEICO's been around for more than 75 years, back when they were using Morse code. Sorry, that's just my sense of humor. What's more, with GEICO, you get 24-7 access to licensed agents on the app, online, or over the phone, so you can talk to them at night or in the morning. So forevermore, just know that no other auto insurer has more more than GEICO. More power to you. GEICO. Expect great savings and a whole lot more.